Hey, Morgan. Hey, I hear you. I don't see you. You don't see me? You'll see me in a second. I can see me. The people out there can see me. Uh, well, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, February 21st, 2014. We've got an intimate, close, special, very special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout this week. We're going to bring it down a notch. We're going to keep it quiet. Not going to be so frenetic. Um, actually, everyone's busy this week. Uh, some kind of sports puck game or something. I don't know. People keep telling me that I should be uh, be watching hockey. Uh, anyway, so this week, but we're going to try and pull together some kind of show and talk about some of the big stories that caught our eye. Um, so we're going to be talking about how uh, ESA is considering uh, net, uh, missions to Uranus and Neptune. Uh, how curiosity is changing its driving patterns so um, because of the wear and tear on its wheels also a cool picture of opportunity from space and an answer for what that jelly donut was on on Mars you could just drop the lawsuits it's been figured out uh, an asteroid went missing just a couple of days ago let's look at that um, and uh, let's see what else we've got um, the majority of Americans think astrology is scientific or do they? Um, and a new planet hunting mission, maybe. A couple of other things if we do it. Probably won't go for the full hour because, you know, uh, it's just me and Morgan. So, joining me this week, the most dependable human being I think I've ever met, Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan, how's it going? Good, I am back. Good. Uh, actually, we have two of you now. I think. I know. Yeah, that's... that's that was really good. I, I think that was very creative to say, like, if we're not going to have a bunch of people, let's just have more Morgans. <laughs> That'll get the job done. Uh, so, Morgan, let's take a chance then for to kind of introduce you. What uh, what's your website? What's your what's your background? Yeah. So, I'm a graduate student uh, studying astronomy and planetary science uh, at the University of Colorado. Uh, I also like talking about space and science, uh, and so I write uh, at cosmicchatter.org. Uh, you can see the tweeter, the Twitter, tweeter, Twitter uh, down there at the bottom at cosmic underscore chatter. And rather than just write about the news, because I can never keep up with uh, people like you, I try to add my own opinion, my own take, sort of a half passionate astronomer, half academic uh, take on the various things that we see and how they might impact us on our sort of day to day lives. And so, so now you say you're you're a you're a graduate student in planetary science in astrophysics and planetary science. So, where would you end up as a career once you finish your getting your graduate degree? We can call so, you Doctor Morgan Redenberg. Right. So, you know, the obvious path would just continue on in academia and get a some sort of postdoctoral job, and then eventually end up as a professor in an office with a blackboard and all of that. Uh, but that might not be the coolest way to go. Uh, and there are other opportunities uh, in terms of doing science outreach, science education, uh, that might be more interesting, more fun, uh, and ultimately more valuable to you know, the American people and the world's population in the sense that we, we're turning out lots of people who can do science. But we need to talk about why we're doing science, how we're doing science, uh, and why science should be and is important to us in our lives. So a big thanks to uh, to Dr. Nicole Gallucci for running the show last week. I was gone. She did a great job, uh, as always. I mean, she's a pro, um, but it was great to have her. Great to have her help. It, it's such a great team. Um, so you can interact with us with me and me and Morgan this week. Um, I've in, I've enabled the Q and A app in uh, in Google Plus in YouTube. So if you want to post a comment or question, that's probably going to be the best way, and we'll be able to catch those questions, and we'll, we got lots of time. I think we'll be able to talk about a lot of these things. Questions um, are more fun than talking. <laughs> um, you could also use the, um, the event page, either the one on Google+, Plus uh, or the, the one in CosmoQuest. You can post a comment there. I can't promise I'll see it, because I've kind of got a lot of things going on right now. Um, uh, you can always use Twitter. I guess you can send a tweet at uh, using the hash. Now nah, I'm not even going to see Twitter. I'm, I'm not even going to make that promise. Do not use Twitter. Uh, do not use Facebook. 
<laughs> really just use the Q&A app. That is all I got. Um, okay, cool. So well, let's get on with things. So first, Morgan, let's let's just go with our big with your big story this week, the thing that you spent the most time on, the thing you know the best, which is how ESO wants to, and I gotta say it, wants to send a probe to Uranus. That's right. ESO's all about our uh, Uranus this week, um, and. Uh, I don't want to make this too strong. Uh, uh, the ESA, the ESA, the European Space Agency, is soliciting proposals right now for what their next upcoming big missions are going to be. And they call these their L-class missions. Uh, and that's sort of similar to what NASA calls New Horizons. So we're talking about about a billion dollars uh, to launch every sort of four to eight years to go somewhere new in the solar system and do something that hasn't been done before. Uh, so these aren't the kind of missions where you'd go back to make uh, sort of follow-up measurements on something that we already know a lot about. Uh, those would be your smaller missions. These are, uh, as NASA calls them, new, new frontiers. These are things that we maybe have a hint of, but we really need to go and make those first discoveries. And one of the areas that's gained some attention recently has been the uh, outer, outer planets. And you might think that we've covered the outer planets pretty well. Uh, we have Juno on the way to Jupiter right now. We have Cassini, obviously, at Saturn. Uh, ESA's first L-class mission will be the JUICE, Jupiter Icy Satellite Explorer, launching uh, in 2022, also going to Jupiter. So we've, we've done a lot of work on sort of the inner outer part of this, this system. We have, by the time JUICE gets there, that'll be the 10th mission to pass or, or orbit Jupiter. And we'll have four missions that have passed or orbited Saturn. But even going out that far, we're still going to have only one mission that ever looked at Uranus and one mission that ever looked at Neptune. And it turned out to be the same mission, and that's Voyager 2. And Voyager 2 didn't really spend a lot of time there. It was flying by on its way out of the solar system. And so it had basically one opportunity to make measurements at Uranus and one opportunity to make measurements at Neptune. And that pretty much represents the sum total of everything we know about a quarter of our solar system. And since then, we've been able to make some ground-based observations. But it basically, where we are is that we know very, very little about Uranus and Neptune in comparison to any other planet uh, in the solar system. And yet, they make up a quarter, and they make up a large chunk of the extrasolar planets that we're starting to find uh, around other stars. And yet, we don't really know anything about them. Yeah, and both of them are really fascinating. Like the the weather system on Neptune with these really high speed winds. There's the fact that Triton orbits uh, in the in the wrong direction from the rest of the right. of the moons that go around Neptune. Like, was it a captured Kuiper Belt right. object? What's the story there? You know, are there cry is there cryovolcanism in some of the moons of of both of these giant planets? I mean, there's a lot of the discoveries that, that, that have been made at Jupiter and Saturn have, have really taught us things about the overall solar system and the kinds of things where, you know, we're starting to find there, there might be cryovolcanism on an asteroid series, right? So, so now we can take all these lessons and we can apply them over to these, to these giant planets that have, as you said, have just been barely explored. I, I actually, we actually posed this question to Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society back in November, and and she goes, "You got to ask me where do I want us to send a, send a spacecraft?" And and then when I did ask her, she was like, "We got to go to Uranus and Neptune. These are the these are the unexplored territories." So the fact that that ESA is considering taking up this flag is is terrific. Yeah. So the problem, of course, is that it's tough to do. It took Cassini seven years to go from Earth to Saturn. And now Uranus is twice that far. Neptune's three times that far. And Cassini also costs more than $3 billion. Um, and so to try to get to Uranus, try to get to Neptune on sort of sane timescales and with a budget that we can stomach today is going to be a tricky thing. And that might mean that we have to do another flyby kind of opportunity. But at this point, we have so little data and so little understanding of these planets that anything, literally anything that we get, uh, will be helpful. And in fact, people are talking now about how New Horizons, when it gets to Pluto, is going to shed almost as much light about uh, Triton as it does Pluto, because Triton and Pluto probably had similar uh, 
origins, like you mentioned, but we've only ever seen 40% of Triton. And we know there's maybe cryovolcanism, there's all of this fascinating terrain on Triton, but we've only seen less than half the planet and, well, less than half the moon, I'm sorry. And so there's only so much that we can draw from that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big problems with this is there's such a long lead time that, you know, if you're going to send an orbiter to to each of these giant planets, you know, it's going to be a pretty beefy mission. It's going to need a lot of fuel to both make the mission, but also to accelerate and get itself into an orbit and then be able to operate over a long period of time. So, plus you've got this 10-year-ish um, time to just travel time to get there. And so it requires a level of forethought and planning and patience that, you know, we're not seeing in the in the space, uh, you know, in our space agencies these days. I mean, the New Horizons to me, when that got announced, I mean, it that mission came together fast and it was launched quickly and it was just came out of left field. I mean, kudos to the to the team, to Alan Stern and the team who got New Horizons together and out the door to to do such a wonderful mission. So it would be great to see to see something similar come together for for Uranus and Neptune. Oh, and, and we know that when it works, it works spectacularly. Uh, Cassini has just completely revolutionized our view of Saturn and particularly our view of the rings and moons uh, in a way that we had really no idea before that we could have these active bodies that were moons other than Io uh, at Jupiter, but now we know we've maybe found a plume in Europa, we've maybe found plumes on Ceres. Uh, you know, there's so many unexplored areas of Uranus and Neptune that would just, you know, magnify that even more. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's move on, uh, but but that's but that's great. I, I totally agree that these are missions that we should we should really do, and and as the uh, director of the International Space Consortium, I make it so. Um, okay, well, let's move on. So, Curiosity. Now, now there was a story that we had all over the place, but obviously we had it over on Universe Today, about how um, the mission operators have been changing the way Curiosity has been driving on the surface of Mars to protect the wheels from the damage, and it's actually been traveling in reverse. And I'm going to share a picture here um, that uh, for a story that uh, that King that King did for for Universe Today. And let me see if I can get this picture happening here. Um, but you can see this just gigantic jagged chunk that's been taken out of uh, out of Curiosity here. Yeah, all the rovers that have spent any amount of time on uh, the surface have had problems with their wheels. Yeah, so can you see this here? Look at this. You see this? Right, yeah. You see this little chunk here that's just been jagged out of uh, out of Curiosity's wheel here. So so this is just one. They've been doing fairly detailed um, observations of, you know, they've been having, it's been taking a bunch of selfies and they're seeing all of the damage that's been going on to the, to the wheels. Yeah, wheels are are a tricky thing because Curiosity weighs uh, almost 200 kilograms uh, or more than 400 pounds and yet it has to have these very delicate wheels to support it because we need them light enough to to put on a rocket and blast off of Earth and you know travel all the way to Mars and so we can't just put on some you know big rubber uh, wheels like we might like to so it's a, it's a very it's been a big engineering challenge to design wheels that are both light uh, yet sturdy and both uh, Spirit and Opportunity have ended up driving backwards uh, as well. The good news is, though, that driving backwards is not like driving backwards in your car. Uh, the rovers are pretty symmetric things, so you basically just turn your head camera around and go, and it's really not that much different than, uh, than driving forwards. But do you think that the, the wear and tear that's been happening to the wheels... Is is within the tolerances that they were expecting, or do you think that that this is more than they were anticipating, and now they're having to compensate a little early and try and be yeah. preventative? My understanding is that the Curiosity team was somewhat caught by surprise by the wear on these wheels. Uh, Curiosity's nominal mission is two years, so that's how long you know baseline they expected the rover to operate more or less at peak uh, ability, and here we are, you know, a year a year and a half now into the mission and we're already encountering these pretty substantial um, issues. Now, it could just be that it looks bad, but it really isn't functionally that bad 
for the wheel or for the rover, and that we're just being a little overcautious uh, because we do want to prolong the life of the rover as long as possible. Uh, so, but, but my understanding has been that they certainly weren't expecting this level of wear and tear at this point. Um, and now Curiosity's already driven 5.2 kilometers, and it's still got about another 5 kilometers to go before it reaches the base of, of Mount Sharp, so, right. or the foothills of Mount Sharp. So it's, you know, uh, it's gone a long way. And it's, yes, got, it. it's gathered a lot of wear and tear. And the other thing to understand as well is that in the past, Curiosity has stopped and just explored an, an area just visually. You know, and we saw this with, with Spirit Opportunity as well, where they would sort of stop moving and then they would just study rocks in their vicinity and then get moving as well. So in some cases, you know, the science team has wanted to get Curiosity through various pieces of terrain, and there'll be other times when it's slowly crawling up this, you know, the the flank of Mount Sharp and trying to get some some close-up pictures. But but it's uh, yeah, it's kind of tough. Yeah, well, Curiosity also, you know, is much heavier than Spirit and Opportunity were, and it was all, it was always designed to be much more active. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity only ever planned to drive about a kilometer on the surface. Now, of course, they far exceeded that. Uh, but, you know, the intention was always, now that we know that rovers can operate freely on the surface of Mars, you know, to get out there and drive. And we've done that, you know, five kilometers already, another five kilometers just to get to our, our next sort of primary science objective. They're clearly, even with the wheels, they're not afraid to take her out and, you know, and spin them a little. And, um, and that's a good thing. You know, and, we, we and have even, it there, we might as well use it. Yeah, and as you said, you know, with within that what three year time frame, they get to the point where the you know, the damage is starting to add up. They can do things. They can they can pull wheels up and not use a wheel. They can operate with less than the full complement of wheels, and eventually we could expect Curiosity is gonna be dragging a you know, a bum wheel along the, the surface as it goes. But you know, and, and part of one of the things that we were really excited about <clears throat> was that because it's got its its um, thermal nuclear reactor on board it really does have the potential to last for a very long time on the surface of, of Mars. I mean, it's not it's not the solar panels in the same way that Spirit and Opportunity are. This thing's got its own portable nuclear thermal power source, and it's going to last. I mean, it's the same kind of technology that Voyager, uh, the Voyager spacecraft are using, the Pioneer spacecraft. I mean, these things have been operating for, for decades. So theoretically, we could be getting power from, from Curiosity for a long time. Yeah, and unlike Spirit and Opportunity, Curiosity, if its wheels break, will be able to operate as a stationary base station. With Spirit and Opportunity, because you had to point the solar panels towards the sun, once it stopped being able to move, that was basically the death of the rover. But as you say, you know, Curiosity has power for maybe decades, and yeah. it could be sort of a permanent weather station on the surface once, uh, once it stops being able to be a mobile uh, mobile operation. All right, we've got more, uh, more news from the surface of Mars. So I'm going to share another picture here, and this is a picture of opportunity from space. So let's see if this is coming through here. There we go. Now, you see that, see that red arrow there? Um, let me just see if I can zoom in here for people. So oh, that, is. that is opportunity. And this, of course, I'm, was captured by uh, the NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from, from space, which has the resolution, has done this before, has, done, has got the resolution to capture various objects on the, on the surface of Mars. I mean, it helped, uh, it helped show the, uh, the landing of Curiosity. You could see the, the parachute. You could see the, all of the landing equipment, all of the stuff that it had ejected. And we've seen, like, the tracks of the rovers and, and such. So this is, this is great. Yeah, well, we saw, you know, just like a couple of weeks ago, uh, right here on the show, we saw, I think it was Laddie, as seen by uh, LRO. It, to me, these are always the coolest things. To, you know, to see something we've put on the surface of Mars using something we've put in orbit around Mars uh, is just kind of one of those uh, things that gives you the shivers. Um, and, I don't know, I just really like them. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, but I always love, like, people always ask me, um, you know, how do we, they want to know whether the Hubble Space, like, why can't the Hubble Space Telescope image objects on the surface of the moon? Why can't we see, to know that we landed on the moon? And people have got all these conspiracy theories about Mars as well. And yet here you go, you've got these spacecraft 
zipping around Mars and capturing, you know, man-made objects on the crawling around on the surface of Mars. It's it's a f phenomenal, just amazing thing that that we're able to do. So, you know, you want evidence that there we have robots on Mars. There's your evidence. Yeah, we're there right we're now. We're there. All right, but apparently not donuts. So let's uh, let's get on with this picture. So you probably all recall um, this uh, this kind of coming out in the last couple of. Uh, had you been following this story, Morgan? Uh, it, you know, I followed it kind of idly until all of the silliness involving the lawsuits uh, against NASA, and that kind of you know got my attention. And I followed it from there, and you know, it was obvious from the beginning that there was going to be a perfectly reasonable explanation. Yeah. So what it was was, um, let's see. So a couple of weeks ago, there was this this picture that Curiosity had taken of the surface of Mars, and then. Uh, you know, 15 days later, 12 days later or so, they took this this second picture, and there was this weird, they you know they're calling it the jelly donut, but it was this weird rock that just had appeared on the surface of Mars. And the way the picture looks, I mean, it kind of looks metallic. It sort of looks like some kind of alien poop, maybe. <laughs> You know, um, and so you know, and so you've got this situation where where. You know, and like literally, what we've had, uh, you know, when we have, remember the Bigfoot? Do you recall the Bigfoot on Mars? There's like, you know, there's like this little, this little guy that looked like Bigfoot. And every time you see anything, there's like, that's a fossil. That's a, and the and the woo woos kind of come out of the come out of the yeah. woo. -woo. And uh, and this this just went right off the charts, and so there was a uh, someone was actually, you know, NASA started to do its research, and somebody wanted to sue NASA because they weren't doing enough research, they weren't releasing this information to the public, whatever. So, so now we've got a story. Have you, have you, do, you, do you sort of know what seems to be the answer? Yeah, so it turns out it's uh, quite terrestrial after all. Uh, and it kind of ties into what we were just mentioning, which is that Curiosity got a bit of a weight problem. Uh, and as she was rolling over a rock... It's not, it's not true, Curiosity. You're, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. Uh, uh, while she was rolling over a rock with perhaps one of these damaged wheels, she crushed it, and the pieces, you know, you crush something under your foot, they kind of shoot out in all directions. Uh, and one of those pieces kind of rolled into frame and just happened to get caught by one of these um, follow-up pictures. And so really what this is is evidence that while we're actually there, we're interacting with and affecting the environment uh, and not simply uh, just observing. I wonder, I mean, I haven't seen anything, but I wonder if there's any connection between that really big damage that we looked at on that wheel and maybe this rock coming apart and doing it. But yeah, like you said, you know, went over a big rock, crushed it with her svelte weight, your beautiful curiosity. Don't, don't listen to Morgan. Um, emails about that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and some of the debris rolled, rolled downhill because it was on a bit of a slope and, and this, this piece lap ended up here. Uh, still, absolutely fascinating to see those, those kinds of, of changes. And it's great when we see this kind of stuff. I mean, we see sometimes, like, uh, we'll see meteorites on the surface of Mars. We'll see a, the effect of dust devils. We'll see where there's, like, landslides and things that have, that have happened. So it's still an active... It's a very active world. Yeah, it's a yeah. very active Just place. as active as the Earth, just, you know, in a different way. Yeah, so... Anyway, uh, now let's take a few questions here. Um, so, uh, number one, hundred billion and one. What would the temperature be on the Martian surface, and who gets to name the terrain, i.e., the uh, the Dingo Gap? So, what's the temperature yeah. on Mars? So, the temperature varies a lot from day to night because, unlike the Earth, Mars doesn't have nearly the same amount of atmosphere. So, during the winter because Mars has summer and winter just like you know we do here on the Earth, the winter, it can get down to be as cold as, say, 150 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and if we convert that to a sane unit, uh, that would be you know, like minus 60 or 70 Celsius. Um, and in the summer, it can get up to be temperatures that you'd find here on the Earth. Uh, now we're talking about maybe you know, the Arctic. But we're talking, you know, we can get to uh, you know, up towards zero. Uh, on uh, the surface of Mars in the summer. 
And uh, and so that's a much bigger range. And the, the range day to night, again, is much bigger as well because they don't have the same protective uh, heat trapping atmosphere that we do here on the Earth. Yeah. Now, who, most of the things on Mars have uh, already been named. The big features have all been named. And they're mostly named after uh, maps that were made back in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, especially by, uh, I think, I believe an Italian astronomer, Schiaparelli, uh, named most of the big features. Little features like, you know, these rocks and things are often named by the mission team that um, discovers them, but those aren't official names or anything like that. I don't know why, what Dingo Gap, why it's called the Dingo Gap. The Dingo Gap is a is a spot, sort of a, like a little bit of a valley that uh, it's about to, to go through. Kiros is going to be passing through this area, and I'm sure the woo-woos are going to write some kind of, campaign because <laughs> going to get caught in some kind of magnetic flux thing. Um, okay, all right, so there you go. Uh, Todd Howard asks, what's your opinion of the crazy axial tilt of Uranus? Oh, somebody uh, was reading uh, my story. Uh, it's a really tough question. Planets weigh an almost unimaginable amount, and they're spinning really quickly, so they have a, just an, an enormous amount of inertia. And so to tip a planet over, like probably happened uh, with Uranus, would take just sort of an, an unimaginable amount of energy. And I've, I've heard kind of two theories uh, floating around about how this could happen. And one is the old planetary scientist standby, which is it got hit by something really big. Uh, but it's sort of like how the Earth got hit by something maybe Mars-sized, and that caused the Moon and maybe caused some of our axial tilt. Um, but it's hard to see something big enough hitting uh, Uranus just the right way to knock it completely over on its side. Another suggestion is maybe during the early solar system, when we now kind of think the planets are migrating back and forth, uh, that it interacted with either one of the planets we see today or a planet that got kicked out of the solar system during this interaction. And so rather than being a physical interaction, this was a gravitational interaction. And so maybe you had a planet the size of Jupiter or Saturn come really close in a kind of an awkward way to Uranus, and gravitationally that caused it to flip over. And the, you know every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Flipping it over takes a lot of energy. That energy kicks out. The, it has to go somewhere. That energy kicks out uh, the planet it interacted with. Uh, the one thing we can be pretty certain about is it didn't form this way uh, because the solar system at the beginning stages formed out of one big disk, and that disk was all moving in the same direction. That's why all the planets move in the same direction. They all rotate in the same direction. All of the big moons, except for Triton, all go in that same direction. That's counterclockwise, and that's because they all formed out of the same disk. And so there's just no really clear way for Uranus to have formed in such a way that it wouldn't also be spinning like everything else in the solar system. Right. Um, oh, uh, Bob Moeller notes, and I, I, I apologize, it was, it was opportunity, not curiosity, that kicked up that rock. So just want to make sure that that's, that that's clear. Uh, we, were, we were, I mentioned curiosity, but it was actually, it was opportunity. Oh, yes. that was, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, okay. All right, let's keep moving then. Uh, what do I have next? Okay, so um, the majority of Americans think that astrology is scientific. So, so tell me, Morgan, do you think astrology is scientific? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, what I do think is that uh, astrology and astronomy get con uh, confused a lot more often than you might think. Uh, and I've met people, you know, all the time who's, who I say, oh, I'm, you know, I study astronomy, I'm an astronomer. They immediately conflate that with astrology or being an astrologist, astrologer. But they I don't, don't even... ask you for, do they, do they want to know their uh, their sign? Do they you know, know, they often they... say, oh, you know, hey, I'm a Libra or a Capricorn or something. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of out of my, uh, out of my, you know, knowledge. But it's interesting because there is kind of a historical basis for this. And that's if you go way, way, way back in history, you know, we're talking back to maybe the Greeks or the Romans, uh, astrology was part of astronomy. And in fact, you broke astronomy up into sort of two uh, sections. And today, uh, we call them astrophysics and astrometry. 
And one was astrometry, the measure of the positions of planets and stars on the sky. And so that's what things like Gaia do, or Hipparchus. We measure the physical locations of the stars on the sky. And the other half, what we call astrophysics today, is explaining how those things came to be. And so we do the same basic thing today. It's just we have, you know, better explanations, and we change the word for it. Um, but there is kind of a historical basis to combining astrology with astronomy, because back when we didn't have a better explanation, astrology, you know, was the state of the art, and you know, it's hard to look down on them too much for that. You know, 2,000 years ago, not today. Yeah. So I mean, one of the the questions with the study is like, is are people confusing the the terms between astro astrology, astronomy, etc.? But are there people who don't think astronomy is scientific? So is there some kind of religious bias that's going on? Right? Yeah, I think it's more likely that there are people who think astrology is scientific than there are people who think astronomy is not. Um, and so when you know, depending on how you pose the question, you might be able to get uh, either response. Uh, but you know, certainly we know that. Uh, American skepticism of science is, you know, nearing an all-time high. And no matter what metric you look at, whether it's acceptance in evolution um, or, you know, belief in the trustworthiness of scientists, people simply, you know, are misinformed about what scientists do, if nothing else. And that leads them to, you know, maybe group in things that seem scientific uh, without really understanding the difference between what makes something scientific and and what isn't. Yeah, it's it's funny when you talk to people who are who are into astrology because, you know, they're doing some things that are very similar. Like they're tracking the position of the planets, they're tracking the position, the phases of the moon, the 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 motion of the of the zodiac and the constellations through the through the seasons. So a lot of that stuff is valuable, and especially if you're a an observational astronomer, you like to go out and take, you know, you want to look through your telescope and you want to know whether Leo is going to be up right now. And you, you know, uh, I know that Leo will never be up in the summer because I'm a Leo, and so that's where the sun is. So, right. um, so there is there is like some value, but it would be, I wish. I wish there was a way to better get people to jump off from the one topic from from astrology and like you think this stuff's interesting we'll check out actual astronomy and I haven't figured out how to get, <laughs> get people yeah, to do that. Yeah, you know it's tough because you know almost everybody is fascinated by looking at the night sky and you know we express that fascination in different ways um, and unfortunately some of those ways uh, can be more productive uh, towards you know coming up with a more informed uh, society than others, uh, but you know, we tend to get attached to how we express things, and you know, understandably so. It's difficult to break people of those uh, attachments sometimes. Uh, so Mark Gillick notes, uh, astrology is to astronomy as alchemy is to chemistry. That's a very good analogy. Uh, yeah. You know, Isaac Newton is often, you know, sort of bashed on for being an alchemist in addition to a physicist and a mathematician and an astronomer and this is sort of you know to knock him down a peg you know he did all of these you know f fantastic things but he also messed with astro ast or with alchemy uh, but you know what he was really doing was developing the the four science basically of chemistry and he wasn't able to put it on the scientific basis that he could math or physics or astronomy uh, but that doesn't mean that back then he was going in the wrong direction. Uh, but, you know, other chemists took over and expanded upon and standardized his work, just like astronomers have taken over and expanded on and corrected the work of astrologers. And so today we have to recognize that, you know, there's a correct and an incorrect. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that in the past it wasn't a valid, uh, valid thing to look at. Uh, Simon Love says, haven't the constellations as we see them drifted significantly since astrology was invented? Doesn't this destroy every argument that they have? Like, if you could actually destroy their arguments and that would convince them, then that would be amazing. But, uh, yeah, you can destroy their arguments and that won't convince them. Yeah, there are actually, the constellations have been moving. There are actually 13 zodiacal constellations now, not 12. 
Uh, and so a fun thing to do if you're talking to a group of people about the difference between astronomy and astrology is you ask, you know, who knows their sign? And everybody puts their hand up. And then you put up a chart with all 13 in and the months that they correspond to. And suddenly 70 or 80 percent of people have changed signs. Uh, well, you, Pamela, we had we did a show on Astronomy Cast about about this, and Pamela is actually an Ophiuchus, right? Which is great. Yeah. So you may not know that you can have a sign as in Ophiuchus, but in fact, the zodiac passes right through Ophiuchus, and for a couple of days, people born in that in that time are come from Ophiuchus. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Uh, and then also, uh, Tom Nathy notes that Newton also wrote a whole bunch of religious books and pamphlets. He also yes. jabbed a uh, knitting needle in his eye to uh, to see what happened. He so, did, and he also, you interact with Newton every day. If you didn't know it, he developed, uh, he invented the ridges on the edge of coins. So if you're in a country that has ridged coins, he did that to keep people from shaving down silver and gold coins until they were basically nothing. And so, you know, back in the uh, 1700s, if your coin wasn't sha it wasn't ridged, it wasn't valid. Uh, and he invented that. Uh, ben Gazali says, if 40% of, er of USA thinks that the Earth is 6,000 years old, it's not surprising they believe in fairy tales. Uh, I, I didn't know that stat, and I, I'm going to just try and unremember that stat. Yeah, I would hope, uh, I would hope that wasn't true, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, and that's distressing enough to begin with. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I think... Uh, all right, well, let's move on then. Okay. Um, how do you like the... Us, two people, trying to pull off this show. Uh, we're uh, doing it. We're doing it, we're doing it. Okay, so do you want to talk about the uh, the European Space Agency's Planet Hunter next? Yes, this, unlike the Europe or the Uranus and Neptune mission, is an actual approved mission. Uh, and it's slated to launch, I believe, in 2022. Uh, and it's going to be doing basically the same thing that Kepler did, which Yay. is look looking for exoplanets by uh, watching for the transits of planets in front of stars. And so this is when you have a planet orbiting a star such that, from our perspective, the sun, or the star, sorry, the planet passes in front of the star, it dims it just for a little bit while the planet's in front, and then when it goes out from in front, the star brightens up again. And you make these light curves, and from those light curves, you can infer the presence of planets. And so using... Right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so the mission is Plato, right? The planetary transits and oscillations... And what's really neat about this mission is that it's actually made up of 34 separate telescopes and cameras all bundled together into a, into a single spacecraft. Right. So unlike Kepler, which had basically one big telescope that stared at one patch of sky really deeply and looked at about 200,000 stars, Plato has 34 smaller telescopes basically in a bug-eye configuration. So they're pointed sort of all, all across a hemisphere of the sky. And instead of looking at 200,000 stars, they're going to look at a million. And the trade-off for that is, is that they're mostly going to be looking at brighter stars. And that's actually a good thing, because brighter stars are easier for us to see than from the ground. And because we always have to go back and confirm that there's a planet there by looking at it with a different telescope, it's easier from the ground to see brighter planets than it is from uh, to see dimmer planets, while from space it's... You know, you don't have the atmosphere in the way blocking that. And so they're basically going to take the Kepler survey and smear it across the whole sky, or half the sky, rather than looking at just a tiny little patch uh, near Orion. Uh, yeah, well, and I mean, as we mentioned in Astronomy Cast all the time, our, our greatest sadness is the fact that the Terrestrial Planet Finder mission got canceled, but but anything that can turn up these planetary candidates is going to be terrific. And so you can imagine, you know, with all the work that Kepler did, I mean, they just blew up our understanding of, of, of how many extrasolar planets there are, where they're located, what kind of abundances we're seeing, this whole new class of super-Earths and mini-Neptunes and, and things like that. Is, is just, you know, and then we're finding these planets in the habitable zone. So to just kind of take that survey up to the next level, my hope is that we're going to get to the point where we're going to have all these missions and everyone is just going to be, there are so many potentially habitable Earth-sized worlds out there. We need another, the next mission, the Terrestrial Planet Finder, whatever it's going to be, this mission that can observe the atmospheres of these distant planets and detect the presence of unnatural compounds like 
ozone, oxygen, pollution, things like that that will tell us that, that not only is this planet in the habitable zone, it's Earth-sized, and there's probably life there. I mean, that'll just, that's mind-bending that we are this close to being able to understand this possibility. Absolutely. We're really getting there. All right. Uh, so uh, one last thing that I wanted to do, maybe I'm not going to have time, uh, which was our good friends at Deep Astronomy, uh, which is uh, Tony Darnell and, uh, and his team, Scott Lewis, who's my, uh, my co-host on the, the uh, Virtual Star Party, have put together a new video for Kepler. And I can't give any sound, I don't think. Let me see if I can share this. But it's just terrific. And, and Tony's... Tony's voice is just like butter. So I really enjoyed it. And I like my advertisements. So let me see if I can play this. In 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched to answer one question. How many stars in our galaxy harbor planets like the Earth? To answer that question, Kepler stared at one small area of our night sky in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan and meticulously measured minute dips in brightness of over 150,000 stars. These dips in brightness were caused when a planet passed in between the star and Kepler, partially. All right, well, you get the gist of this. So, uh, mad props to... Uh now yeah, still in my ears here. So you can get that from uh, the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel, um, and I think it's T Darnell on on YouTube. But uh, man, it was just fantastic. So I know Scott put in weeks of work, and Tony put in lots of writing time and stuff, and it's just an absolutely terrific video. So if you haven't already, go and watch that and subscribe to them over on on Deep Astronomy. Um, all right, let's see if we've got any more questions here. Um, so I'll, I'll throw out one thing before uh, you take a question. Sure. Which is, you know, the point of the video is that, you know, we now think maybe there are more planets than stars in the Milky Way. And, you know, we think there are at least 100 billion stars in the Milky Way alone. Um, and while that might seem like a kind of a shocking thing, it, it maybe shouldn't be so surprising to us. Uh, because astronomers subscribe to uh, something called the Copernican Principle. And the Copernican Principle says basically that uh, the, everything about us, whether it's the Earth or the Sun or the solar system, is pretty average. Uh, we're not, you know, the Sun doesn't go around the Earth. We're not the center of the solar system. We're not the center of the galaxy. We're not the center of the universe. And in the same light, it shouldn't be unusual that a that there's a star system that has eight planets. And certainly we wouldn't expect, you know, there to be more star systems that have, uh, you know, zero planets really than, uh, than, than any other number. And so while it might be kind of an initially, you know, breathtaking idea that there are over 100 billion planets uh, in our galaxy alone, you know, the fact that we have so many wonderful and beautiful and fascinating planets right here in our solar system should lead us to think that that's probably the case almost everywhere. Yeah, that there are billions probably of of habitable worlds in our Milky Way. Is... And that's something we, we thought but just didn't know until the last few years, and it's just yeah. exciting to finally have confirmation that, yes, they're out there and they're everywhere, and everywhere we look, we're just going to keep finding them. Yeah. Um, Lawrence uh, Nadiv Nadivsky uh, asks, have you, did either of you watch the Bill Nye debate with, uh, with Ken Ham about creationism? Did you watch it? I, I didn't watch it, and no. I really didn't follow it that much. Uh, they tend to kind of devolve into people talking at each other without a lot of uh, swaying of either side. Now, I, I remember, I think Phil Plate wrote, uh, a pretty good piece in the aftermath of it talking about the importance of continuing to engage with and address people who are science denying. Uh, but I guess personally, you know, I, you've seen one debate and you've seen a lot of them. Uh, it's the same points brought up on both sides. Uh, and I'm thankful for Bill. 
uh, for doing it because I don't know if it's something that I'd want to go out and do. Uh, there is over and over no again. way that I would want to debate a creationist like that. It's uh, it's just not worth the pain. Um, uh, you know, when we set up the uh, the Bad Astronomy Universe Today forum, this is something that Phil and I put together like 10 years ago, I think, which is now hosted over on CosmoQuest, we would let people come in and post their, we would call it against the mainstream theories, into the into the forum, and then the the folks in the forum would then have a debate with them about about whatever it was that they thought that Jupiter was going to turn into a star or what have you. And I always knew that the value of these conversations are not for to try and convince the person who's proposing the theories. When the creationists show up, you're not trying to convince them. What you're doing is you're trying to watch the people who you're trying to convince the people who are just watching from the sidelines, who are maybe sitting on the fence, who maybe just haven't really had a, you know, are interested and, and are actually critical and rational thinking, but haven't necessarily had reasonable facts put in front of them. In a in a reasonable way, and and so you're really those are the people that you're trying to convince, not the people who who you're actually having the argument with. Who cares Absolutely. what they think? They're you know they're already they're already too far gone. It's the same thing with you know climate change deniers. It's the same thing with a lot of this stuff. Is you know yeah. you need to consider your audience, and I and I think that that Bill Nye is great for for that kind of thing. He's got a great, very positive, very sunny personality. He's very entertaining and yet very serious. So I think he, you know, he did a great job, and and I think you know it's still worth doing. It's still worth you know you don't want to have these shrill arguments. And I think the way that debate worked was very much like two people just putting up talking points and not really having a direct conversation. But but the more of this, the the better. So anyway, I don't know. Thanks, thanks, Bill, for doing yes, something that you, I, I don't want to do. Why. Yeah, thank you, Bill. <laughs> um, well, I think we're all through the story, so let's go um, take some questions. more questions here. Yeah, uh, Simon Love notes we should make rovers out of Legos and just send replacement bricks to Mars with a small builder robot. I think that's <laughs> that's great. One of the you know, if I was running the space agency, um, one of the things that I really feel is like there should be an assembly line of these kind of dependable rovers just queued up and ready to go. And then, like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Let's just send Curiosity, and we'll send Curiosity 2, we'll send Curiosity 3, and just keep, <clears throat> you know, running them off the factory and firing them to a new location on Mars. Maybe a slightly different scientific payload depending on where it's at, and just keep the, keep the science rolling. Yeah, so we're not doing that with rovers, but NASA has taken steps to do that with uh, spacecraft. Laddie is the first of a new class of uh, modular spacecraft, where they have a series of the sort of you know the the sort of the frame and the engine and the communication system, and they can just kind of bolt these onto pre-assigned places on this framework, and then there's places for scientific payload. And the hope is that this will reduce the cost and increase the reliability uh, of the spacecraft we send. Because you're right, right now spacecraft are built literally by hand, piece by piece, over the course of years. And that drives up the price. And you know, every time you invent the wheel, you overlook something. Uh, Hugo Burnham notes over on Google+, Plus, how many gyros will ESA put on it? Uh, and for my, for my, you can never have enough gyros. You can never, ever have enough gyros. Put 20. I want to see 20 gyros on it. It's yeah, I don't know how many they're going to put. I will point out that Kepler did outlive its initial lifetime, and that's, uh, you know, it's a budgeting issue. You have to put on there what you can afford to put on there to last the length that you think you can operate it. And they did that with Kepler successfully, and they just got unlucky. Because Cassini's been running off of gyros now for uh, you know 17 years, uh, with you know, and it's it survived. And so Kepler just kind of got unlucky. And thankfully, you know, in the grand scheme of things, Kepler is not our biggest, most expensive, you know, most ambitious mission. And we can follow it up with something like this. Now, a bunch of people have been having an argument over on Google Plus that that Curiosity has a mass of 900 kilograms on Earth. And you mentioned 200 kilograms, so I mean it's got a lot less gravity that that it's holding, but it's sort of right. It's a question of weight versus mass, uh, yeah. where weight is the physical force, and it's it's quite possible that I quoted the wrong number uh, that I just saw quickly uh, before coming on. But right, so 
we have the mass of something which is constant no matter where you go. So in space, Curiosity had some mass. And that's the same mass it had on the Earth and the same mass it has on Mars. But Mars is Mars itself has less mass, so there's less gravity, which means there's less weight. And so Earth has about uh, what we call 1g of acceleration, which basically equals weight. And that's 9.7, um, sorry, 9.8 meters per second squared if you're a physicist. And on Mars, that's about uh, a, qu a quarter to a fifth. So we're talking, I think, I want to say it's, you know, on the order of, you know, 0.2 or 0.3 uh, Gs, so several meters per second squared. So that means that with the same amount of strength, you could more easily pick Curiosity up on Mars than on the Earth, uh, but they have the same mass, and it's kind of a subtle distinction. Yeah, it's I, I people always will ask me that question because I'm Canadian, and so my bathroom scale measures in kilograms. I step on the scale, and it tells me what I weigh in kilograms. Now, obviously, what it should do is it should tell me what I weigh in newtons because that would be the appropriate way for my bathroom scale. But I'll say things like, you know, if you step on the bathroom scale, it'll say 100 kilograms, but if you're on the moon, it's only going to say, whatever, 17, 15 kilograms because right. the force of gravity is so much less. And people are like, the kilogram isn't a measure of mass, it's a measure of, you know, isn't a measure of weight, it's a measure of mass, and your kilograms, I understand that. Well, yeah, My bathroom scale yeah. says kilograms. Yeah, we're very ambiguous about it in real life. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. leads to, even scientists are often very ambiguous and interchange weight and mass because most of the time it's not important. Uh, because most of the time what you care about is the relative difference between things, not the absolute amount. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, we understand. We understand that, yeah. that mass and weight are different things. You might things. have caught me, uh, yeah. but... Um, okay, so I'm going to... So before we roll, I want to sort of answer one question here, which is, this one comes from Bobby White, which is, uh, I've noticed the Patreon set up to support Universe Today, but I want to support not only the Universe Today, but also Cosmic Quest, 365 Days, Astronomy Cast, and all the great thing that we produce. Is there a way to contribute to all the things? So there isn't, and let me explain why. Because we are all separate entities. You know, Morgan runs his own website. I run Universe Today. Pamela has Star Strider. Nicole is a noisy astronomer. You know, Ian O'Neill works for Discovery. Every one of us is kind of a separate individual. Um, now, th but then there's all these collaborations. So, for example, Pamela and I do Astronomy Cast. Uh, me and lots of people come and do the Weekly Space Hangout. Lots of people come together and do some of the stuff that's happening with, with CosmoQuest. So we kind of have to keep things separate. So for when people, as, as you mentioned, we've added Patreon. If you haven't seen this, Patreon is amazing. It is a way for the fans who like the things that we do to support us directly, to give us money every month. And for Universe Today fans, I'll remove all the, the ads off of the Universe Today website. Uh, we'll give you advanced access to all the videos and have secret mailing lists that you can talk to with each other and give us, uh, you know, production, you know, get in on the inside track on the productions that we're doing and so on. And you can get that from, from patreon.com slash universe today. Now, we're, we're considering implementing this for Astronomy Cast, and I mean, like, I'm so excited and I'm convincing Pamela, so probably in the next couple of weeks we'll roll out a Patreon campaign for Astronomy Cast so you can directly support Astronomy Cast. And you can also support CosmoQuest, but CosmoQuest has... 365 Days of Astronomy, and the Virtual Star Party, and this show, and 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 I know it's confusing, but it, it kind of has to be because we're not one entity. We are a collection, a loosely coupled collection of, of friends and, and a community that we really try to help each other out, and, um, and we want to help you out. So, so that's, sort of the, that's sort of the way this works. So if you want to contribute to Universe Today, go to, to patreon.com slash universe today. We're probably going to be implementing this for Astronomy Cast. And if you go to CosmoQuest, there's information on how to donate and sort of what projects you're, you're contributing to. Yeah, so, you can donate to specific projects on CosmoQuest, whether you want to support the, you know, the podcast or the citizen science. Yeah. Uh, and you can kind of be fine-grained about what you're interested in there. Yeah, and we're going to be doing a hangout-a-thon uh, in the next couple of months where we're going to stay up for thir 36 hours, I think, and entertain you and uh, and 
hopefully you'll be able to support a lot of those ongoing projects that we're that we're doing. We'll get into a lot more more detail there. The bottom line is that you know we are trying to do everything we can to raise the awareness of science to get the information out there about space and astronomy and you know I wish there was a way you could just sort of support all the things, but if you really like what we're doing, then you may want to support us individually, and we would really appreciate your help. So, um, all right, so Morgan, where do we find out more about, about you? How can we yeah. support you? Uh, Go to you your can, website. Yeah, you can support me by going to my website, uh, cosmicchatter.org. I won't take your money, unlike Fraser and Pamela and some of these other people. I have a, we will gladly an take actual, your money. yeah, I have a, a day job. Uh, and this is uh, not how I keep myself alive, but I'd love your eyeballs, uh, and I'd love your tweets, uh, and you can t uh, tweet me at, uh, at cosmic underscore chatter on Twitter, uh, and, you know, I've started, I guess, on uh, Fraser's uh, space uh, Google Plus community uh, doing a weekly uh, question and answer uh, Monday, uh, Monday afternoons, uh, North American time, if you have a space question about something you've seen in the news or something you just heard on TV or really anything, you can drop by, and i am uh, been answering questions most of the afternoon on uh, Mondays. And so, if, you know, if this isn't enough for you, uh, then maybe, I'd love to take time. Maybe you should do that. Like, you know, I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but uh, maybe you should do that on Fridays. Like, after we do the show, you could just move over to the community and you yeah, just that'd keep be, answering uh, questions. Well, I will move over after this. And uh, if you have any questions um, that we didn't answer now, I'd love to uh, chat with you for a while more. You are you are awesome, Morgan. I really appreciate all of the support and help that you've been giving. You've been oh, I appreciate the them. chance. Yeah. So yeah. So there you go. So if you want to know how to find the space community, just do a search on Google Plus for space, and you should be able to find the space community. Join that, and uh, and Morgan will uh, will keep rolling with answering questions. So, so hey e everyone, thank you so much for for watching us. I know it was just the two of us. I hope we kept you entertained. Um, uh, and we will see you all next week. The next thing that's going to happen, of course, is the virtual star party. That's going to be on Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast, which is now 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific uh, Standard Time is when we're probably going to start. And then we're going to move to daylight savings time in just a couple of weeks. So and then it's going to be like 8, so getting later and later. All right, well, hey, thanks, Morgan. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all next week.